UNLV Arts Worldwide, and we are excited to be here with our global research episode. And here's our Dean, Dean Nancy Escher. Hi, Nancy. Hi, Lewis. This has been an exciting journey, this episode. Um, and I think that we've both been struck by uh, the imagination and the collaboration uh, that helps form some of the work that goes on globally in arts research. How do you see that? You know, Nancy, last week we were talking so much about um, collaborations and um, what's amazing is that in this episode we have two really deep long-term collaborations that are being explored. And it's amazing to me how a body of work can be created that is transformative of communities and transformative of art forms when two people or a group of people come together and become, as you say, thought partners. I love that. There's so much work that artists and humanists can do to help our society. And in both of the collaborations, one of which includes you, that we're delving into today, um, there's some, so much good work about, uh, you know, looking at human rights, for example, uh, family and sexual violence, children's rights, you and uh, Bob Tracy looking at ways to express really important uh, principles and uh, ways of exploring the world as you travel, you know, widely to share with people. You made the point also that in traveling, you learn about your work in a different way by exposing it to different audiences. And you and Bob learn from each other. Uh, and I think, you know, for our guests, uh, Verena and Jackie uh, from, from Brisbane, Queensland, Australia, are constantly having that same kind of dialogue, learning from each other as they, as they you know, apply arts principles to the kind of social impact research that they're doing. Yeah, it's, it's, quite, it's quite amazing and profound. And I'm also reminded at, at how much our students at UNLV have benefited from the great international travel that the college has done, that it's really transformed them when they encounter other artists from around the world and other cultures and other places. So. You know, we often talk about how people are uh, responding to the pandemic. Uh, you ask very thoughtful questions about that. And we, you and I were talking about how these research projects can provide stability and a kind of an anchor to our thought leaders and to our arts uh, practitioners, to our arts researchers, because they are doing in some fashion problem-based research as well as performing for audiences all over the world. And uh, this is just an important way of life. Even at a time like this, we're looking for the next project. We're excited about what we can create, how we create knowledge through the arts and humanities. So, and, and in a certain sense, our series is an example of a response to the pandemic in which uh, we, I think you and I both feel being able to share these stories and these ways of thinking with the public all over the world and our own students and faculty here at home at UNLV, it, it, it makes us feel uh, safer in a certain way because we know we can count on it. Yeah, the arts are such an anchor, Nancy, and they're a good rudder also. I think for, for those who, uh, the artists make the work for others people, but also for the artists themselves, they provide a good anchor and give us direction, so. We are excited, Lewis, to share these stories, uh, some beautiful footage of projects, uh, interviews with our audience today. And so welcome to our episode on global research. Hello to our audience. We are really thrilled today uh, to have two marvelous artists with us 
who've had a very special artistic collaboration over the years. One of our guests you will recognize because he is Louis Kavoris, who's the chair of our dance department here at UNLV. And as you know, he's the curator of our series, UNLV Arts Worldwide. And we're really, really pleased uh, to, to also have Robert Tracy, who's a professor in the Department of Art, a very interdisciplinary thinker as well. And uh, these two individuals have made art together for, for a long time. And I'm, I'm gonna sort of delve into, you know, how did it happen? You know, what has kept them going all these years? They performed together uh, as thought leaders and as artists and as performers all over the world. So first of all, um, Lewis and Bob, welcome. Um, you, you've Nancy. had this long history of uh, collaborative works. How did you find each other? Uh, how, did it, how did the collaboration start? You know, I probably can start. Um, in 1999, Bob was the um, assistant dean of the college. And we went to Edinburgh and that was, we've talked about this in the past, Nancy, it was an amazing year where we had 40 students in Edinburgh for the entire summer and Bob was there and I was there and um, we kept seeing shows together and we had just a summer of dialogue about art and the arts and the potential for the arts. So I think this collaborative um, partnership started then when we started working together and um, wouldn't you say, Bob, that that was the, the starting point? That was definitely the starting point. There's a, as I look back on this, there's a song that I remember by one of my favorite singers, Cat Stevens, who had a song called Sitting. In the last lyrics, he says, oh, uh, this world is made up, our life is made up of, is like a maze of doors, and they all open from the side you're on. And we were given a, a series of doors with Edinburgh. Yeah. And Lewis had dance, I had art, uh, film, music was involved, theater was involved. And each of us had a door. And we each reached out ourselves and opened those doors. And it was a great opportunity. However, we were in spaces that shared spaces. So that's how we collaborated. And it was a natural fit. It came very naturally. It's very exciting how your collaboration has deepened over the years. And you've been, you know, had a fundamentally transdisciplinary approach to art in the way you conceived of these works. Uh, I want to tell our audience uh, how far flung the places are that, in which you performed Las Vegas, Edinburgh, Oxford, Venice, Vancouver, and hopefully next year in Perth, Australia. Yeah. Um, I note that the current work uh, in which you are creating art is called In Dark Times We Begin to See. What does this work focus on and how does each work help you build the next work for the future? This particular work is based on a painting, a very, very large scale painting by the Philippine artist Jig Depio. Jig has a studio here in Las Vegas. I've curated three shows of his work on campus and he is Philippine, born and raised in Manila, educated by his father into the arts. And he is an extremely, extremely gifted artist. He's also very aware of his heritage, the Philippine heritage. In the uh, 18th century, England and Spain before them had colonized the Philippines. And the Philippine nation was trying to, the Pil Philippine people were trying to regain their sovereignty. William Makes Peace Thackeray wrote about it in the play or the book, uh, Barry Lyndon. So the title of the painting is Rewriting Barry Lyndon. It was inspired by reading the book by Jig Depio, reading the book, the, the, the Thackeray book, and then watching the movie by um, Stanley Kubrick, Barry Lyndon. And so he did a nine panel painting that's about the size of a billboard. And each one is layered with the story of the Philippine nation trying to regain their sovereignty. And so we divided it into five layers. What you're gonna to see tonight is layer five, where we talk about um, the, the title of the fifth layer is memory, a moment, a scene, a fact is a form of storytelling. So I, I address the idea of storytelling and Lewis translates that into movement and choreography. Yeah. 
And it was um, also when you're dealing with what we found dealing with at this time, the pandemic colored the piece because that brought a nature of the dark times. And then also the dark times of all the social justice and the Black Lives Matter happening right now. Without doubt, um, that resonated with the work. So we had quite a few discussions about how to shape that into the work um, as well. You know, what a great model and inspiration for our students to see the rich joy, the, the, the rich uh, reward, personal reward, as well as reward for everyone who gets to see the work that you do, for our students to see that they may well meet other students right here at UNLV, Absolutely. where, you know, it, it, that they start to collaborate with here. And that kind of a journey uh, can be continuous for them, perhaps in the future, where they find uh, artists with whom to collaborate here and continue. Because one of the inspiring aspects of your work together is that it's been decades. Yeah. You've grown together, uh, you have a great deal of enjoyment and, and satisfaction uh, to come up with these ideas and explore them, and then to share them with the world, as well as back here in <laughs> Las Vegas. Are there any other aspects of your work together that you'd like to bring up today that we haven't yet discussed? I would, I would like to say that we did, we did a performance piece on campus with an Egyptian artist, which is almost a prelude to Hearth the Firth. It was just before. Yeah. Um, this is a, a woman artist who was born in Cairo and she had a gift and she was not given any value in Cairo at that time. And her father and, and mother recognized she had gift. And so they nurtured it and she ended up immigrating to the United States. And I met her through her work and she's an impressionist painter. Uh, she did a whole, a very, very large body of work. And I brought to the concert hall, two pieces or two bodies. I brought her, her uh, watercolors of ballet dancers and also her watercolors of showgirls and worked with Lewis and worked with Dolly Kalepsik Mahmoud in the dance department, and we did a performance piece in the lobby of the concert hall that was in many ways magical. Something happened, and you could see the connection. We talk about connection, but you could see it, you could feel it, and it was a very, very successful performance on campus. So, and that was a, an artist who's here in Vegas, Egyptian. I'm drawn to a lot of very diverse artists, and, you know, Lewis understands that in the we give the permission to each other and it, it's just fabulous. That's, I think that's been part of the globalness is the global artist that Bob brings to it also. And I agree, Nancy, that I would say to most of the students, the students that are watching is find people to collaborate with because it pushes you outside of your, your ordinary spot and um, you find magical things and new ideas. Yeah. You know, listening to this example of the project you did in the concert hall reminds us that the word global itself is very interesting uh, to analyze because we can be global at home. We can be local on, in another part of the world, you know? And uh, so it's just a, a, rich, a rich concept uh, where we can come together as a, as a, as a world society uh, and make, make art and be influenced by different cultures in the way we think about art. I want to thank both of you uh, today for such an interesting dialogue and conversation about the work you've done together over all of these years. Uh, Bob and Lewis, thank you. We look forward to the, the works for the, the current work and the works for the future. Thank you so very thank much. Bill's use of the term stitching together references installing the nine panels as one, which constitutes the scale of rewriting Barry. is most opportune as the artist preserves the integrity of the Seven Years' War narrative, even though it is cinematically dis dissected into nine separate panels. Memory, a moment, a scene, a fact, is a form of storytelling. Depio Journal that his creative process in rewriting Barry focused on conjuring in his mind a shape of movie, an image of the Seven Years' War before attempting to approach the canvas. This conjuring process felt right to the artist as he continued to use it on all subsequent panels. Hi, 
my name is uh, Nanda Sharif Poor, and I am an Iranian uh, American artist living and working in Las Vegas. I've been here for eight years now. Uh, the work that I'm going to be talking about today is uh, called One Love, and it is a, a light installation uh, located at 900 South Las Vegas Boulevard. It is on the corner of uh, Hoover and Las Vegas Boulevard South. This work was curated by Dr. Laura Henkel and the Soho Loft management was uh, kind enough to uh, let us use their uh, location for this piece. This piece is, has been up uh, since March 2020 and is going to be on display until November 2020, until election time. So the, just to give you a little bit of background on um, my work and my education, uh, so I have a master's degree uh, in um, art from my own country, Azad University, uh, Tehran branch. And then I, when I moved to US and uh, started living and working in Las Vegas, I felt the need to go back and uh, kind of like update my knowledge about the uh, new system and everything. So I went back to uh, University of Nevada, Las Vegas, UNLV, um, and I graduated uh, with another um, uh, master's degree in fine arts uh, in 2019. So that was the time that I had like a very traditional form of education uh, in arts. Like I was creating two-dimensional traditional form of art and then still working with the same topic of the social and gender issues. But then once I started creating works over here in the United States, I felt the need for myself as an artist to experiment with other mediums of art. So I started working with sculpture, um, installations, video art, and that was the time that I felt like I was freed completely and I was able to express myself completely. So um, I can now call myself a multidisciplinary artist and art has been uh, my voice the way to send the message out and first um it was uh the tension between the united states and uh iran happening like escalating my heart was kind of like ripped apart because these countries are both one is my homeland where i was born and i was raised and the other one is the place that i live at and i have like tons of friends and I have memories created in every corner of it. So it just pressured my heart so much. And I decided to create this work in response to that event. And initially I was going to um, have a large scale print of the court of Gayumar's uh, Persian miniature that shows all human races circling around a chosen uh, one that is Gayumars and uh, it's like uh, the Garden of Eden and there's like all sorts of animals and plants and they're all living in harmony. So I was going to choose that work and then show that it is set on fire to reference the tension that was going on that all the beautiful things that can be destroyed and gone forever during a war. But then, as I said, it rapidly changed to other events that went from my personal sorrows as an Iranian American artist to something more global that was affecting everybody in every corner, everywhere around the world. So that was where I decided to transition have this transition from just like one persian miniature work uh to a poem that without giving you too much of visual information gives you food for thought this poem that is actually uh from 13th centuries and it is from a persian poet saadi shirazi and it carries the wisdom of the past, and I find it relevant every day towards any event that targets the humankind. All human beings are members of one frame, since all at first from the same essence came. When time afflicts a limb with pain, the other limbs at rest cannot remain. 
If thou feel not for others' misery, a human being is not named for thee. This is the translation that uh, has been used in a handmade carpet hung in the United Nations office in New York City. As you read the poem, it's just such a beautiful reminder of how we are all connected. And it's not like you sit in your safe spot and everything else is falling apart and it's not gonna affect you eventually. So in such situations, for example, when the COVID-19 situation happened and we had everybody doing their part, trying to keep each other safe, trying to help each other um, in different areas, this again was relevant to me. It was a reminder of how we need to help each other to finally go through and come out successfully out of this misery and disaster that is happening. And then soon after there, there were like these social issues that we were like facing for such a long time, but then they were like surfacing um, just recently once again. And uh, we had the Black Lives Matter movement. Um, and that is again, like if one member of humankind is facing like social or racial injustice, the others cannot just sit and watch and keep being happy. So it's about all of us. It's about the whole humanity that needs to come together uh, to fix a lot of problems to have a happier world. We're continuing with our wonderful episode about global research in the arts and related topics. Uh, and we could not be more excited and more pleased than we are right now uh, to be with two wonderful guests uh, who are currently in Brisbane, Queensland, Australia. Uh, Verena Thomas is Associate Professor in the Creative Industries Faculty at Queensland U University of Technology. 
And Jackie Cooley is Senior Research Fellow in the Creative Industries Faculty at Queensland University of Technology. And they've both done extensive work in the Pacific. They've both been also very active in a university in Papua New Guinea called Garoka University. I personally have had the pleasure of knowing them for several years uh, and have learned and been inspired by their work. Uh, Louis Kavoris, our curator, and I will be very, very uh, inspired and happy today to have this conversation which I know we'll enjoy very much. So, Verena and Jackie, welcome to the program. Welcome to our program. Thank, Thank you. you so much. Thank, Thank you. you. And Louis, <laughs> you had some ideas about how to frame this conversation, which I really appreciated. Yeah, I'm, um, I, I love the idea of what your program does and um, really using the arts to create change. Um, how did the program start and how did, how did the two of you meet each other? That's really interesting. Did you want to start, Verena? <laughs> or do you, do, uh, up to you, do you want to start? My story goes, goes a long way back, but I'll try and make it short. Um, I, my background is in documentary filmmaking and I had a, a personal connection to Papua New Guinea. One, one of my great uncles was a missionary there and he lived there for over 50 years of his life. And, and that was a great documentary story for me so that brought me to Papua New Guinea but what I um, realized there was that the, the mode of film the the video and the storytelling was so important in connecting the two worlds I'm originally from Germany and the history of my family um, through my great uncle and connected to the country in Papua New Guinea um, was just such a just a strong theme that set up many many relationships for me in Papua New Guinea and through the filmmaking as well. So there I found that filmmaking as a tool for social change and for these having these conversations. So I then started working at the university there, the University of Goroka. And that's where I met Jackie. We held a conference there uh, in 2014, the Our Media Conference, which is all about community media. And um, Jackie participated in it and we started talking and having conversations and we found that that we had a lot of shared values in using the arts and the processes of the arts as a way to engage and have dialogues with communities. Yeah. So I met Verena, I had heard about Verena by reputation. Um, I was, uh, so my background is in drama and applied theater, applied performance, drama in education. I was working, before I came down to Brisbane, I was working in communities, um, and using drama to address uh, issues and behaviors around HIV that exacerbated HIV and AIDS um, in these rural communities. And drama was a vehicle to carry out these messages, but incorporating indigenous ways of working and knowing. Um, and so one of the things that we didn't have very strongly in PNG was a, a representation of a university or an arts degree. I mean, I come from an arts degree and that was one of them. But Verena came in with a different kind of way of working as well too. And, and the filmic approaches to that were also what, um, what I thought was incredible. Um, she also had, they also had like an incredible website page and, the, and a postgraduate degree up there. So I met her in 2014 and I think that's how we started working um, together. I think what was important were the intersections or the ways in which we brought our, our fields uh, together. So I'm in drama, she's in filmmaking and how the hell, how the hell, how did we bring the two together to actually create a way of engaging with people, but also creating a way that we could um, communicate these messages. Um, and it was interesting as well too, because when we started working um, to getting un people to understand, uh, perhaps in Papua New Guinea, how the arts actually can contribute is a way that you can create and start a conversation, but it is contextualized. I think that was also the other thing um, of why we work together and why we have such a strong connection together. And since 2014, we've not uh, separated. We've always been on projects together. <laughs> Wonderful. That's a beautiful summary of a very deeply important and meaningful collaboration that the two of you have had uh, to look at communities, uh, look at ways you've used the arts and creativity in gender and human rights programs to create the social change and to transform communities. What are some of the projects that stand out to you? Uh, I know you've been generous in discussing them with me 
uh, over time. How, what did the, what projects were most meaningful to you where you could see that change could happen on behalf of the members of those societies? Um, did you, I'll start Rena, yeah? Okay. So one of the, uh, before I met Rena, one of the projects that I work on, as I talked about, was the HIV project. Um, and it was about drama and about performance and performativity. I come from a country that is very rich in, in all of those oral narratives and of symbols and of artifacts and of the interpretation of that and that worldview. And bringing that into a place where people could understand it, but draw from it, yeah? So it was the HIV performances that we designed, co-designed with the participants in this rural community, I think for me was important, not just because of the performance, but because it helped people to understand the importance of performance and ways of knowing within Papua New Guinea. The project for, for now, with the way that Rinder and I are working, I think it is a project called the Yumi Kirapim Senis. It's a gender-based violence project and we worked in four different communities in Papua New Guinea to look at the ways in which communities were understanding violence and how they were supporting the change from within. And policy, policy makers within government, I suppose, did not um, think that we had this uh, initiative solutions from within. And a part of our work was about making that visible for others to see that. And that was an important um, contribution milestone, I think, for me, because um, Verena is very skilled at curating these things at a national level. And when we did it at national level, there was traction and there was conversation. I'll, I'll end it there. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, you, you talk about storytelling as being a powerful tool for you. I can tell you the way you're telling this story is also very compelling to us. And I know it will be for our audience for whom this is unfamiliar. Um, Lewis, how are you hearing these wonderful uh, stories uh, that our guests are sharing with us? I, I just can't wait to see some of the projects, but what, what other areas have you tackled? I mean, these, I, I'm astounded by um, the topics that the two of you choose to, to tackle within a community. T tell me about the other topics. Yeah, so um, I guess the topics are related to what are the current issues that are going on and that are um, that are identified as as issues that that require perhaps a, a deeper thinking around how they can be addressed. And one of those issues in Papua New Guinea has been a sorcery accusation, and we talk about sorcery accusation related violence. So people in communities being accused by other community members as being uh, sorcerers or witches, and um, this resulting in torture um, or, or violent acts towards these people. And um, so we, had a, we have a long-term project on this. And um, as you can imagine, um, the, the complexity of the issue, um, you know, um, it makes it makes it quite tricky. I mean, the, apart from Papua New Guinea being incredibly diverse with with over 800 languages and different ethnic groups, um, the understanding of this as a contemporary issue built on on belief system, but the manifestation of it being really triggered by socioeconomic current issues. And what we found is that um, when we looked at the media representation of these issues there was a very much a limitation to how they were being understood. Um, that was how uh, those who were being accused were portrayed. Often the, the um, horrific nature of some of this, this violent acts being displayed, but we were actually looking at what could be the solutions. So again, we continue to work with our community partners in understanding their narratives. We work with human rights defenders to see what are their motivation to create this change within communities? And how do they um, understand this complex world? And, you know, when we work in the field of what we might call communication for development, there's often this idea that, you know, if we could just simplify the messages um, to communities, perhaps then they could understand. But we find that it's incredibly complex. And by working with people that know the communities, they are able to engage in these very complex narratives. And that's what we capture. And in this case, we, we captured over 40 digital stories um, of human rights advocates 
And in a way, they offer over 40 small solutions to the issue because they are contextualized, they're based on the real experiences, but they're incredibly powerful. And we've used those stories in communities to motivate others to create the change. And so this is the idea of solutions coming from within, within those contexts. And that's one of the example projects. It's called Yumi Sun Up Strong. Yeah. I think I'll just add to Verena, the other way, I think people sometimes we get the projects, but other times people come to us because they need another way of doing um, work, a creative and arts based approach to doing it. And they're not quite understanding what that means. Um, and so the two of us come in for that one. And the variety of projects are across climate change, mobile um, services in Papua New Guinea. Um, it could be any, uh, any part of it, or sometimes we offer, uh, we mentor students or we mentor people to actually produce their own work. And that could be an array of different ways as well of working. So it could be about agriculture. It could be about livelihoods. It could be around those different things. Right now we're doing an education project to look at quality elementary education, um, prep schools, young kids in Papua New Guinea. So it's all those things. Part of our struggle initially is getting to understand the various different components of art space and the way of working with people um, and, and enhancing that. Um, but once we work through that, I think then we have a collaborative group that is a collective that understands the way of working. And I think that's always a good thing. And we find the challenges very inspiring because it forces the two of us to rethink the way in which we want to talk about it. And we're always saying, all right, pedagogically, how will we approach this? And that's always a part of our conversation when we're stuck with something. <laughs> yeah. I, lo I, love, I love the idea of the collaboration because uh, this episode, one of the, the themes that's come out is how collaborations move us into new territories where we question our, our normal ways of doing things. So I, I love that the two of you have developed this relationship. And, and the constant learning between the two of you, right? And uh, we have some other examples on our episode today where the collaboration becomes really a tool for lifelong learning. Yes. Um, I, not I noticed that uh, before we came on the program, one of the issues we discussed was that when solutions are found within communities, uh, they are more sustainable. Could you talk about that definition of sustainability, which I think is quite powerful? Yeah, sure. I think that, you know, the arts of us a tool for reflection and of this kind of engagement that takes us into other spaces, whether we draw on imagination or uh, different, you know, ways you mentioned collaboration, creating together, co-creating. And, you know, we see the world from different perspectives and the arts allow us to have the tools available to do that. And that is true for global arts. So, you know, we could share our perspectives through an arts project, but it's also true for what happens within communities, these microcosms, where they, we have different perspectives. The women have different perspectives from the men and the young people have different perspectives. So when we use these creative tools, people learn about each other's perspectives. And so they start to understand each other. And therefore, then they can start working together on the solutions that you know, they can find a consensus for within the community. Once they've gone through this process of reflecting and action and creating something together, um, then because they know each other better, they're more able to develop the solutions and deal with the challenges that face them. But it is offering different perspectives and having the tools to um, share those different perspectives in creative way, ways and for many of our projects to do that in a safe space. And the arts provide us with the tools for that. Yeah. I think just a small addition to that as well, too, is that the arts processes activate what is already there. There are social systems and social networks that are already there. And as Marina says, it is that collective perspective, but within that, there is a history that we draw out as well. So it kind of reminds them, ah, these are our systems. And perhaps a hope is woven through the threads, through the narratives, so that they do uh, believe in themselves, that they do create that change. But always we work within the systems that are already there and making uh, and just helping them to say, not helping them, but 
having them see things differently to tap into already what's something there and then strengthen the social system that they have to think about the future. So it's about, this is not just for us here. This is about our kids, our kids after that. This is a generational thing. What can we do to support that? Given that we do not have the necessary systems in place, yes, yeah, structurally by the government to come in and support it. What can we do to tap into our own to create the, to create the sustained change? And they, and they tap into their own networks to do that, yeah. It's marvelous. The Turks and Caicos Islands are 650 miles from Miami. They are in the British West Indies and a series of Turks Islands and Caicos Islands. Providencialis is the capital. UNLV Dance has done four residencies in the Turks and Caicos. This is our 2016 group. Barbara and Mark Pankhurst invited us. Barbara and Mark started the Turks and Caicos Friends of the Arts Foundation, and they built the beautiful Stargazer Villa. Their goal was to bring the arts and create a place where the arts could be celebrated on the island. Stargazer has beautiful views. Barbara loves dance, so she built a dance studio at Stargazer. And the view from the dance studio always inspires you to keep dancing. The Pilates studio and the deck were a perfect place for morning stretching and for yoga. We didn't use the tennis courts much, but we used the pool all the time. And Mark's passion for astronomy meant there were beautiful views of the stars at night. And down a short path, Stargazer has its own private beach and a coral reef. This was a beautiful place to let go and to just think about dancing. It doesn't get much better than this. We thanked Barbara and Mark every day for inviting us into their beautiful home. Life here wasn't rough. And at the end of the day, there was always a beautiful sunset and often a spectacular meal. Dancers love to rehearse. And with our own private studio, we could rehearse all the time. We did ballet and tap dancing. and modern contemporary dance, more ballet, more contemporary dance, and even Alexander class. Sometimes we danced at the pool, and sometimes we didn't. After rehearsal, you could walk through the beautiful Stargazer Gardens. Or down by the beach. Or snorkel. Or do nothing. We never grew tired of the schedule. The biggest thing we do on the island is we teach a lot of dance. We did lecture demonstrations and dance classes for over a thousand students on the island. We taught them the foundations of ballet.
and choreography class, where we made our own dances. And tap dancing, We made many new friends, and we realized you were never too young to learn how to dance. We did performances all over the islands. Some of the stages were outside. And our audiences they were so attentive, and they asked great questions about dance and art. And sometimes, the dancers on the island taught us their dances. Each time we're in the Turks and Caicos, we invite every dancer on the island to be in a dance with us in our performance. And we choreograph the community dance. It's a dance where we get together and we celebrate ourselves. Life on an island is beautiful. We learned to eat new things. And we learned that the dog on the island is a special breed called a pot cake. Over the years, some of us have taken pot cakes home as souvenirs. One day we kayaked to our own secluded beach. This beach had its own wildlife. The Turks and Caicos Islands are beautiful by nature. When we packed our bags, we took home memories of the beautiful islands, the beautiful people we met, the beautiful discussions about dance and art, and all the sunsets. got a bit more tan. We saw rainbows. We met new friends. And we realized that the arts can connect us and make the world a better place. Nancy, what a wonderful episode. I'm, I'm so struck by the collaborations, the passion for work, and, and always the way that the arts can transform the world around us. And Lewis, we've, throughout the series, we've talked about that the arts are essential, they're empowering, um, and they help people make meaning of their lives. I think they were great examples on today's episode uh, of empowering communities, of, of uh, reaching out to uh, people all over the world. Uh, and for artists such as yourself and, and some of the other guests we had uh, to constantly be learning and reframing uh, what the work is about and always looking forward to the future. Because another theme that we have uh, interrogated here is about optimism and possibility. And whenever we interview our guests, I think we both feel uh, that there is so much we can do in this world. And uh, that's really what the arts is about. Yeah, I know the arts are so uplifting and they give us, they give us direction. They give us hope. It's perfect. Lewis, at the end of each episode, we say, uh, see you <laughs> next week or see you in a couple of weeks in this case. And you say, this is UNLV Arts Worldwide. We are reaching from Las Vegas to the world. <laughs>